Hello, 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 and welcome back to The 12. This is a show about the Women's Super League, aka the highest division of women's football in England. We're here to discuss all things WSL, both on and off the field. Each week, we'll be breaking down games, showcasing stars, and highlighting important stories surrounding the game. My name is Deepti, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Mark, Tom Bomb, and Treb. And this week, it's about frequent flyer miles. These players been racking them up because it was international break and they were flying all over the world to play some of these games. Um, so what we're going to do is instead of rolling through each score of the international games, which you can easily look up, we're going to highlight some WSL players uh, from each team who performed pretty well um, and who we'd like to yeah highlight for this international break. Mark, go ahead and start us off. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to start off with uh, my favorite team, of course, uh, Chelsea. Um, and actually, uh, for these uh, for this rundown, I kind of focused on the uh, Euro qualifiers. Uh, you know, there are still seven spots up, up for grabs uh, in the 2025 Euros coming up. And uh, Chelsea has some players involved. So uh, start off with arguably the uh, player in the best form in the WSL right now, Joanna redding Kennerit. For Sweden. Uh, Sweden had a tie against uh, Luxembourg, um, and it was as easy as it sounds. They won 4 0 and 8 0, uh, with JRK starting and scoring in both those matches. Um, Aaron Cuthbert had Scott and uh, her country, Scotland, were up against uh, Hungary, and uh, they won their legs 1 0 and 4 0. Cuthbert started both matches and scored a banger in the second one. Uh, she scored the second goal in that one, too, which I think uh, pretty much sealed the tie. And I uh, also wanted to highlight uh, Guru Wrighton, who uh, started for started both matches for Norway. Norway played uh, Albania, and their tie was even more lopsided. Uh, they won 5-0 and 9-0. Uh, Wrighton, across the two legs, had three assists and one goal. Um, and so, yeah, all of those players will be moving on to the final round of the uh, playoff uh, qualifying. And uh well we wish him luck nice treb uh i'm gonna talk about well since mark got to talk about his favorite team i'll talk about mine uh kira Cooney cross with one of if not the goals of uh international break against germany in australia's two to one win it was her first goal for australia as well as her 50th cap on the night so uh, a lot of emotions running high for her. Uh, when she was talking about the goal after the match, she just mentioned that they they left her open and they let her play a little bit too high up the pitch. Um, she mentioned that she takes those shots in practice and in training, and uh, she usually tends to play deeper as a six for Australia uh, and unfortunately doesn't really get to <laughs> get to play a lot for Arsenal, so we don't really see it. Um, but, yeah, she just she got space. She let it fly and hit a banger for sure. Um so, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a goal. If you haven't seen, I would go to Twitter right now, look it up, uh, and watch it because holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Tom, round us out with our host teams. <laughs> so um, I'm going to actually talk about a... Uh, Manchester City women's legend in Steph Houghton, who led the Lionesses out onto Wembley Field um, before their match with Germany. Not sure that they're going to consider her a good luck charm going forward based off of the results <laughs> of that match. Uh, uh, and uh, also Lauren, <laughs> Lauren Hemps uh, played the full 90 in that particular match. Um, also of note, um, Abba Fugino, uh, scored um, in Japan's 4-0 um, win over South Korea, and Yui Hasegawa had an assist and actually got 20 minutes of rest. She did not, not play the full 90, which, as a City fan, I just want to wrap her, her in bubble wrap at all times so that you know she can play all of the time because Gareth makes her play all of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so all right. Um, that's... That's what I got on, on City. Nice. <laughs> I'll take us to the other side of Manchester. Um, on Man United, 
First player I want to highlight, Grace Clinton, also uh, with England. She actually didn't play in that match against Germany, um, which maybe they could have used her going down <laughs> 3-0 quite quickly. Uh, but they brought it back to 4-3. That game was just bizarre. Um, but she did play in their second tie against South Africa, which England ended up winning 2-1. She started that match, um, played about 60 minutes, and she scored their what ended up being the winning goal in the 23rd minute. Um, so she's a young star uh, that United has, I think, like, United's a great place for her to grow and um, keep budding. So that's good. And then another player on United uh, from Norway, Celine Bizet Ildesoy. She played uh, in both Albanian matches, uh, the matches against Albania, and I believe she bagged one assist to Frida Monum in one of those games. I think Manu scored a hat trick uh, in the second game. Yeah, I think she had four. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I guess Albania was food. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, coming back to me uh, and the next team I'm going to highlight is Tottenham. Um, and actually, I'm going to talk about Scotland again and Martha Thomas. So Martha Thomas has not uh, scored yet in the league in WSL, but she scored a pretty crucial goal for Scotland. She scored in that first leg to uh, on the 60th minute mark to make it 1-0. Um, and then she scored the fourth leg in the – oh, sorry, the fourth goal in the second leg. Um, you know, of course, at that point it was wrapped up. But, uh, you know, pretty key contribution for her. So I'm sure she's feeling pretty good about herself. And then uh, – I will highlight Claire Hunt, who has been uh, a fixture in the back line for Tottenham, who is Australian. Uh, Trev mentioned that game uh, that they played versus Germany. Uh, they won that game 2-1, which was their first win over Germany in 19 years. And Claire Hunt, uh, being a center back, actually scored the winner. Uh, she scored, like, uh, the ball like, kind of went over the keeper, uh, and she was there on the back post, and uh, just managed to, managed to nod it in. Um, and so, yeah, you know, pretty interesting time for Australia. They are un currently under uh, interim head coach uh, Tom Samani. They look for a permanent head coach. Um, and, you know, it's a crucial time. They're hosting the 2026 uh, AFC uh, Asian Cup. And, uh, you know, like they've had their, the, you know, their 2023, like their moment, you know, and of course they want to capitalize and especially considering it's probably a golden generation for them. So be curious to see, uh, you know, what it's like for them going forward. Nice. And keeping it on the youth kind of level. Uh, moving on to my other favorite team, Crystal Palace. And uh, Lexi Potter for England's under-19, she had a really good international break. Uh, they took part in the Algarve Cup, I believe that's how you pronounce it, in Portugal, as they prepare for uh, their kind of under-19 championship qualifications next window. So this was kind of just like a prep uh, tournament type of thing for them. Um, but Potter was able to get a goal in the first match uh, against the Netherlands, which was a 3-1 win. And then in the second match, she actually wore the captain's armband for the team uh, in their 2-0 win over Norway. So she's getting a lot of play time, uh, a rising star, not just for England's ranks, but for Crystal Palace and a player I'm sure they will continue to lean on as they move forward throughout the Women's Super League season and a player to keep your eyes on. Because uh, if she keeps her form, you know, maybe that carries over into into the domestic uh, league play. And uh, we see we see her kind of take off here in a critical stretch for Crystal Palace. Um, I'm going to be recapping Liverpool, and I'm going to take you to probably the most um, exciting Euro qualifiers, which was um, Wales versus Slovakia. Um, mm -hmm. Wales lost the away match 2-1 um, in Slovakia. Um, Kerry Holland uh, played 64 minutes in that match, and uh, Gemma uh, Evans played the uh, entire 90. Um, they brought it back to Wales. Um, just Fishlock scored um, to uh, level the the tie 2-2. And then in the 114th minute, uh, Kerry Holland scored the game winner. I, no, sorry, 112th minute. 
scored the game winner um, and sent uh, Wales into the next round, which is pretty amazing for them. Um, again, the most uh, exciting Euro qualifier tie of any of the Euro qualifiers, at least to me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, also, nice. Taylor Hines played uh, the full 90 versus, um, versus France for Jamaica. Um, which that was, um, again, like the probably the most shocking announcement of the international break as far as WSL players and where they were going, what federation they were going with. Right. Mm -hmm. Good to know that she got the full 90. I know even though they lost, it was probably still good, good minutes for her. Mm -hmm. um, all right, my next team is Aston Villa. Uh, there's a couple players uh, here. Uh, Noelle Meritz uh, plays for Switzerland, uh, and she is kind of stagnant on the back line for them. Um, they had two matches uh, as friendlies. One, first one was against Australia. Uh, second was against France. Um, Switzerland drew Australia 1-1, and then they actually beat France in one of, I guess, the more shocking upsets of uh, the international break. Granted, France's bench had a lot of their more typical starters they were playing kind of their b team but still good win for switzerland to get under their belt um yeah they won 2-1 merits played in both games um and on france uh there's another aston villa player who we've talked about a lot actually uh kenza dali who honestly mm -hmm. i don't know if she showed much this break either um it seems like like we've said this season, she hasn't found the spark yet. Uh, so hopefully she gets that back up. Yeah. Um, and uh, so for my final team of this roundup, I'll be focusing on West Ham. Uh, and I'll be focusing on three players in the back. Uh, so there's uh, Kirsty Smith, who actually has not played a lot for West Ham so far. She's only played seven minutes in one match. But uh, she came off the bench in the first leg and started the second leg for Scotland. Um, and so, you know, uh, again, big accomplishment for her. And, you know, good for her to get on the field as well. And, I mean, like, that's a lot of pressure to come on in a game like that after not having played much for weeks. So good for her. Um, you had Amber Tiziak, who's been uh, uh, for Belgium, who's been a fixture in West Ham's back line. Uh, she started the second leg. Uh, in their two-leg tie versus Greece. And Belgium drew the first leg nil-nil and won the second leg 5 nil. So uh, Amber and Belgium will be moving on to the next round. And finally, uh, how about some goalkeeper love? Uh, oh, yes. Kinga, like yeah, Kinga uh, Szemek. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, representing Poland. Uh, she, and she has been playing all year for West Ham. Uh, she started both of those matches, and Poland won 2-1 and 4-1 versus Romania. And so, uh, yeah, we will be seeing them in the next round as well. Nice. nice. Uh, and it always comes back to Arsenal for me. Uh, even though I'm talking about <laughs> Brighton's Michelle Adjemain, uh on loan via Arsenal, she had a great international window. Uh, for England's U23 side against Portugal, scoring the only goal of the match, a late goal, uh, late goal winner uh, in the 84th minute, I believe. But it was just her second match for England, and she's already got her first goal. So she continues her tremendous form and continues to make the case to possibly have that loan recalled immediately, mm -hmm. asapsually. And getting back in Arsenal <laughs> squad. Uh, no, I, I don't think that happens. I don't think it should. She seems to be having a lot of fun out in Brighton, and yeah. they're doing really well, kind of building around her for the interim. Uh, very much hope that's not a permanent deal situation, and she is coming back to Arsenal. But she had a great window, and her great form continues. So another player to keep eyes on, if you haven't already. I mean, she's been having a great season so far. So, If Crystal Palace is your second team, I think Brighton's mine. Yeah, I can see that. A lot of yeah, Brighton's fun to watch. They're a lot of fun to watch. All right. Who's left? Tom. Uh that would be me and um we have Everton. And I always love it when uh players go away from on international break and then have to face each other 
um, during mm -hmm. international break, which that is what uh, Justine Habermet and uh, Beatrix uh, Sari had to do, um, uh, representing uh, Belgium and Spain and Greece, excuse me, rep uh, respectively. Um, as Mark mentioned, uh, it was a goalless draw in the match in, in Greece, and then uh, Belgium was able to bring it home uh, five nil in the reverse fixture. Um, both players got the full 90 in both matches. Um, um, also, uh, Katja Snowies um, of the Netherlands uh, played uh, and scored a, was subbed on late and scored one of 15 goals that the Netherlands hung on Thailand <laughs> in the international window, which was probably the most lopsided um, fixture uh, of uh, yeah. that, that any WSL players uh, participated in. Indeed. And then finally, to round out this roundup, we have Leicester City. Um, first player also on the Belgian team, uh, the two matches that Tom just mentioned. Uh, we have a defender, Sari Keys, or Keys, I'm not sure how to pronounce that correctly. Um, but she also played in both matches, um, ended up being uh, holding Greece scoreless both times. So that was a good showing for the Belgian defense. Uh, and then I also want to highlight Chantal Swaby because we love the Swaby sisters here on the 12. Um, and again, kind of stalwarts for uh, the backline um, center backs. And she plays for Jamaica, of course. Uh, unfortunately, they did lose to France 3-0, but the Swabies are going to Swaby. We love them. <laughs> and we'll be talking about Jamaica. Yeah, I was like, we'll soon. get to them. <laughs> we'll, we'll get, get to them. them. Mm. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, yeah that was we, your there, there are things to be said. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was your roundup. Our, our aim, I think, here is just to kind of highlight players that you may not be watching always or hear about all the time um, instead of just running up scores. So, hope, uh, yeah, hope you learned something or like found a new player to follow. What we're going to do next is just run through a bunch of storylines from this last week, week and a half, because uh, a lot has kind of happened. Um, yeah, I guess we'll just do like a headline <laughs> rundown as well. Uh, so first thing, uh, we will start with Alex Pop, German legend, is retiring. She announced retire uh, retirement from international duty, uh, and she played her final game um was it against england or was it the second match it was the second it was against australia yeah it was against australia okay and i think she only played about 15 minutes before yeah it was a short appearance oh, but short, officially yes. mm -hmm. against australia mm -hmm. yeah legendary player has a lethal header <laughs> yep. yeah yeah uh she scored uh Six, yeah, 67 goals and 145 caps for uh, Germany's senior team. Uh, she's been representing them since 2010. Um, she, fun fact, in the 2010 U20 World Cup, uh, she, winning the title with Germany, uh, she was the tournament's best player, top goal scorer. She scored in every game of that tournament. And her 10 goals is tied as a is a record tied with Sydney LaRue and uh, Christine Sinclair. So, mm -hmm. you know, even before she fully arrived with the national team, with the senior national team, you know, she was, she was balling. And yeah, you know, like for the last 14 years, I mean, she's a name that's been synonymous with German football and uh, just in women's football in general, you know, and so it's yet another stalwart retiring this year. Like, can you all please stop retiring? <laughs> yeah, all our favorites are just leaving now. Yeah, that's true. Getting to that point, I feel like I even came into like the women's soccer scene late, but I still have watched a lot of these players who are retiring recently and like who have announced their retirements this year. They're kind of the ones who got me into it, and I've watched for a long part of their career. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, stop retiring. <laughs> um, do you have any favorite Alex Pop moments? Hmm, I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I, I just like how she gave the U.S. national team fits. She was just one of those players. <laughs> like, every time they played Germany, it was just like, okay, 
where's 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 Pop gonna be? Because that's the player that is inevitably gonna get at least one uh against them. So it was it was one of those players that one of the rare players that struck fear into the US women's national team, I feel like. Yeah. As a player, maybe not so much Germany as a whole, because not many teams strike fear into the US women's national team, but just player wise, like Pop <laughs> was a was a player that they absolutely had to keep eyes on at all times. Yeah. Agreed. Well, since Trev, you pissed off one half of the uh, listener base, I'm going to piss off the other. I keep on wondering if Pop was healthy in Euro 2023. Is, is <laughs> it still, does, does it still come home? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Good well? question. Mm. Spicy. I don't think I made Americans it. mad. Are they, are they mad at that? I don't feel like they're mad at that. I was just being honest. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Listen, if they can't recognize greatness, that's their problem. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shout out to a legend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, mean, uh, I think it wasn't a, um, I don't think it was a national team so, thing, uh, but I just remember. Oh, but- Sorry, I was going to say, it's, it's, it wasn't a national team um, thing for Papa. I think there, it was a Champions League game against Arsenal, actually, where was mm. it she who, like, Jen Beattie ran into and just, like, completely bodied after uh, scoring, like, a I think so. uh, equalizer. Yeah. That was just so funny to me. Like, besides her, obviously, her, like, skill and on-field play, I just loved the, like, the tension and kind of, like, aggression and, like, all those moments that came out of her as well. Um, mm-hmm. She was just, like, a fun character to watch as well. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so moving on to our next headline. Uh, so it came out that uh, Viv Niedema had surgery on her left knee. And uh, she'd actually missed uh, a couple games before that uh, due to what was described as a niggle from uh, Gareth Taylor. Um, we did receive uh, another update on today, the recording on November 1st. And uh, it was described as a minor procedure the actual uh, injury or the actual surgery and the timeline is unclear still, but they don't seem worried. So um, I don't know. Tom, how are you feeling about this update? Um, so this is what Gareth Taylor had to say about it. Um, quote, it was a minor procedure, a little niggle we felt may have gone away. But after discussing it with the surgeon, decided to do a small operation. She's been fabulous with young players, and her importance on the pitch has been top. She's added another dimension, getting herself right with surgery, getting fit and strong. We'll have an advanced version. Um, initially, I was freaked out because I, you know, you don't announce a player has a surgery like that. Um, then, based off of other headlines. Um, and the stories that came out afterwards, it made me think like, oh, maybe she just had her knee, knee scoped, which is not uncommon to do. And like um, athletes are usually out for four to five weeks after that. Um, and I'm hoping that it's about the same with this. But um, again, there's been no confirmation about it. Um, so I'm feeling okay but i don't like the fact of not having her uh, available for basically until christmas yeah i mean at least they've done well uh to this point without i mean like it has been totally without her but i feel like she hasn't like she's played well when she's played but i don't think it's necessarily hit the ground running but you know i think city is still okay to them. I mean, like, they have, they have enough talent, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, last season it came down to... I, I think it helps that Joe Rourke has been informed. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Uh, next headline, we heard that Brighton manager Dario Vidosic was named the WSL manager of the month for October. And 
I've already said I love Brighton, and I think this was well deserved. Um, <laughs> they've you. had a great, great start to the season. Um, yeah, they've like uh, scored a bunch of goals already. Like their goal difference is pretty good. I think uh, they've scored about ten in uh, five matches, and yeah, it like they they're a completely different team from the last couple of seasons. Uh, and I think Dario Vidosic has like done well with a bunch of new players as well. And obviously he's like a new coach too. So coming into this league and kind of hit the ground running with it. Uh, yeah, yeah I agree. I, it was funny uh, on that, on the uh, tweeted announcement in the replies, uh, there were Chelsea fans who were salty about Bonpas so not winning it again. Guys, <laughs> you can't win it every month. Like, yes, you could give it to the same managers every month. But no, I'm, I'm glad that they actually went outside the box. I was kind of wondering if, uh, you know, Mark Skinner was maybe Yeah, that's unlucky. what I thought yeah. might have might have had a good shot. But. Yeah, but I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with Dara winning it, honestly. Yeah. I think that's I think, just like oh. working. Oh, sorry. I think that's just like him working with a little bit less than what United has in terms of talent yeah. on paper. Yeah. So I think he gets that bump like, over Mark Skinner, who, you know, has a like United isn't overly super talented, but they're talented enough to where you're not really surprised at them sitting at third because they've always been a, a team in a club that you're like, okay, if they can just get it together, they can compete. Yeah. Uh, but I think nobody, I don't think any of us saw Brighton really fighting. And looking as well as they've looked, like they're not just top four and you're thinking, okay, they'll fall off in time. Like they look like a team that can sustain this for the run of the season uh, if they can stay healthy. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think that match against United is probably what bumped him to manager of the month. Um, if United won, maybe Skinner would have gotten it because that would have, I mean, they're still undefeated, but that would have uh, given them all the wins. But, um, the fact that Brighton was able to kind of adjust to a poor first half and turn around against a team that on paper, like you said, Treb is stronger, uh, that must have bumped him up, at least in my eyes. I think that would have. But I think it's deserved. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, so uh, the next uh, headline that we're going to so talk about the next headline. is. Oh, 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 you got it, Tom? You want me to get it? I got it. You got it? <laughs> <laughs> I just figured because it's Arsenal, no, I would always it's, just... It's, it's you. It's I you. Would, sure. I mean, at this point, I got the theme going. I, you know, every week I say we're not going to do this, but every week I'm the one talking to us about Arsenal. So fuck it. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Uh, Renee Sluggers every was told week, week that... She, yeah, she was told that she will remain interim manager at Arsenal uh, at least for another stretch. Um it's looking like Arsenal are going to take their time, rightfully so, in choosing a manager. Uh, so far, they've played well under Rene, and they've looked good. Uh, they've definitely looked a lot more improved. And with how their players have looked at it at international break, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they come back continuing the form. I do. I was on here last week saying that they had to have a manager uh, after this international window, just because they do have a really crucial stretch to the season coming up. But if they can somehow get through this. Uh, I mean, if they can if they can just somehow get through this, I think it'll be best case scenario because I do think they need to take their time uh, knowing that the next manager to come in is is essentially going to get the Mikel Arteta treatment in terms of being given the keys to the car, the resources, the funding, uh, the support, everything they'll need to be successful. So you definitely want to make sure you get that decision. Uh, absolutely right. And. Interesting timing, as it's been pointed out by a lot of people, that them kind of pushing back the date also opens them up to potentially snagging an NWSL coach. And there has been long whispers uh, this season about having one Laura Harvey return possibly to Arsenal. Mm -hmm. So if that timeline is lining up, and, and I know that just speaking from someone who – covers NWSL, which do have a couple games on tonight. Uh, shameless plug for them. But, uh, yeah, just, just as someone who's familiar with that, if there ever was a year to tempt Laura Harvey from leaving Seattle, it's this year. Um, they're a team going through a massive rebuild right now, and it just it wouldn't surprise me if, if she kind of 
follow suit with some of the legends that have kind of taken bow from Seattle and and moves on. So, but just a name to keep a keep an ear out for. Uh, but yeah, Arsenal rocking with the interim uh, interim for another few matches. Um, you mentioned the timeline. Uh, also of note, uh, MLS Cup is December 9th. So that'll be the final day of their season. Uh, and so uh, the WSL comes back from international break that weekend as well. But uh, I mentioned that because uh, there was a link. Um, I don't know if that's been debunked or what since, but there was a link to a uh, former Man City manager who is now uh, the manager of NYCFC. Uh, it's Nick Cushing or Brian Cushing. I was I forget the name. I know it's a Cushing. Yeah. <laughs> Nick. Uh, Nick. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, I would say uh, no. So, I would say no. Hard no. Hard, hard no. no. I mean, like he's had success in the league. You know, uh, he's he's been spoken about well. I think it was um, uh, there was. I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but there was a journalist who was quoting Nikita Paris, um, and they were, and she was talking about like coaches that she's worked with and the attention to detail, and she mentioned uh, Nick Cushing. So yeah, I just you know I, I thought that's interesting. Yeah. Um, you're talking about NWSL coaches and cover your ears. Uh, Gotham fans and Pride mm. fans, but <laughs> mm. Juan Carlos Amaros and Seb Hines. I mean, I don't think it would hurt to ask. I'm not saying they would ever leave their current teams, but I think Seb would. I genuinely do. I genuinely think if you came to Seb and you were like, "Look, we'll God give, you, we'll give you the keys yeah. to Arsenal." <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I really do. I think Orlando's a great uh organization and and the way that they've turned it around has been great but i think of the two i see seb leaving easier in terms of like just being able to walk in there and be like look we're arsenal we'll give you full control of the women's side like do for us what you did for orlando just with a lot more money no salary cap and you know the name of arsenal behind you so I could see it. I could see. It. I don't think it'll happen, but I could see that happening in reality. More. If he did a little more hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if those conversations happened, would he be like, "Hey, Barbara, you want to you want to come to London?" I, <laughs> you know, we could or, we could arrange another ticket. <laughs> Barbara Bander, for those of you who don't. Oh know. man. I'm sure he would try, but I think Imagine. it would be much harder to get a player to come. Oh yeah. To WSO out of NWSO than it would be a manager. Fair. But Seb Hines is a good shout. If you don't, if you aren't familiar, look up Orlando Pride. Uh, just look up their last four years. I would just suggest looking up how they've looked mm -hmm. and then look at where Seb Hines arrived and then look at where they're at now. So <laughs> yes. Haley Carter also deserves a lot of credit for their rebuilds as well. True, true, mm. true, true. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the Ballon d'Or happened. Um, I am not <laughs> real big on individual awards in this sport. Um, yeah. Aitana Bonmati won her second in a row. I mean, whatever. It was it was all the Barca dolls, uh, one, two, and three. Um, as far as um, WSL um, participants, uh, Mariona Caldente was eighth, Warren James was 13th, Bunny Shaw was 15th, Lucy Bronze was 20th, Myra Ramirez was 21st, Suskin Nuskin was uh, 25th, Yui Hasegawa was 26th, Lauren Hemp was 28th, um, Naomi Germa was not even nominated, was not, so yeah, just, not. Yeah. He's, he's yeah, absolutely nothing to me, but um, Unserious. what, yeah, <laughs> um, as far as and as far as WSL, as far as WSL players go, like Bunny Shaw at 15 and Ron's even still being on the list is a joke. Um, <laughs> like you can't tell me that Bunny Shaw is not in the top 10, <laughs> even if like. Jamaica didn't do as well as they wanted to do in international competition. Like, just no, I'm sorry. And again, uh, 
Lucy Bronze was nominated on this list and she was 20th. That's really, really sad in 2024. That's crazy. But yeah. That's, that's I think I the got. Lucy Bronze nomination along with the Naomi Grimm and non-nomination are just mm -hmm. two, two signs that that award is. Yeah, even if you take get rid of all the like attackers and midfielders on this list, look at the defenders who are on there and compare them to Naomi Grimm. What are you doing? Ballon d'Or. What are you doing by not <laughs> giving Naomi a nomination? I know this is a WSL pod, but we <laughs> I can't even like fathom not having her on. That's that's how you know that this award is not all it's cracked up to be. Well, and the the thing that really annoyed me about the Ballon d'Or is why are there less awards for the women's game? Like, you're just telling on yourself that you're not actually watching the women's game. You know what I mean? Like, instead of, uh, like, even putting in the effort to, to you know, for, like, who would be, uh, like, a young player or a goalkeeper, right, or a young player, or I guess, what was the Gerd Mueller trophy? Was that for the best striker? Like... You you could easily give those awards to, in the women's game as well, but they just don't want to. So and it, it's it's just more reasons to not take it seriously. Yeah. And I don't think Bomati is a bad winner. Like, I don't think that that's like an egregious, oh, my God, she shouldn't have won because she's right. had a phenomenal year, especially yeah. if they're going to count World Cup twice, kind of like I guess they're doing with the dates of – the the kind of the the nominations but it's just unfortunate when defenders aren't getting the love that they they deserve in my opinion like if it, it feels very much like an offensive award which is going to be interesting because now heading into 2025 naomi uh naomi gurma has three goals as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> she has she has a hat trick so she's scoring goals now you've you've convinced her to score goals so congratulations right. To the rest of the world, uh, she she was already the best defender, and now you've turned her into an offensive threat. So thanks, I guess, for that. Uh, you know, <laughs> got one more shot of espresso, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's um, yeah, it's just hard to take the award seriously on both sides. You look at what they did on the men's side too. And she has a lot three of, more goals than 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 everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, well, I'm, I I was gonna say then Alex Morgan, but whatever. Oh, oh okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. See, now Tom's really trying to get us in trouble. With, with the, with the <laughs> <wrong> <laughs> too. That, okay, we don't need to spare the NWSL fans. Okay, listen, listen. we do not be yeah Morgan stands coming after us. But I agree. I think you just look at the rankings for the WSL players, and <laughs> some of them are egregious. You know. Yeah. Bunny Shaw is definitely higher than 15. Uh, Lucy Bronze probably shouldn't be on that list. No. Yeah. Uh, I'm fine with Caldente at eight. I'm cool with that. But obviously, that was a lot of her work with Barcelona. To be that was fair. Barcelona. Yeah. But I'll take, but you know what I'm saying? But we'll take credit. We'll take it. We'll take it. List, <laughs> list it under the Arsenal badge. It's all good. <laughs> uh, okay. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. We heard from uh, a couple, I guess, pledge of a, a pledges of investment and just money being put into both the league and European women's football as a whole. Um, so I'm actually going to start with the new TV deal with uh, for the WSL. Um, I know, like in much earlier episode of this podcast, we talked about what like the league could do to bring money in and how. Um, the WPLL CEO, uh, Nikki, was saying that, you know, she was like, oh, it's actually kind of hard to get investors and whatever. And she's done it. Nikki just has done it. They have a massive TV deal now with Sky Sports and BBC um, for the WSL. It's going to be £65 million across the duration of five seasons. And that doesn't include production costs. So once you include production costs, it's estimated to be over a hundred million pounds in investment uh, from the broadcaster's side, which is massive for five seasons. Um, that is a huge, huge increase on what the current deal is, which is about seven to eight million per season. This will bring that up to about 20 million per season. 
Um, yeah, I guess Sky Sports is going to have most of the WSL matches live. Um, the BBC will have a handful of them as well. Some of them exclusive. Some will be shared and shown on YouTube. Uh, so this will be about, th I guess, three different places that you'd be able to watch every single game. Uh, but yeah, this it's just good for the growth of the game. Yep. I um, I actually didn't read this until just now, but uh, there will be a large increase in the number of women's championship matches as well uh, on YouTube, which, uh, you know, I was kind of uh, a couple weeks ago, I was looking at that because it, it you know, I'm now subscribed to the Women's Championship YouTube channel, but then it's like one match a week is shown. So, you know, it's like, yeah, I can follow the scores, but it'd be nice if I could watch a little more. Um, so that's, you know, that's definitely promising. One thing we talked about off air um, with this investment in, um, you know, the production and um, technology overall, you would assume. Uh, could this lead to the introdu introduction of VAR starting next season? Yeah, with new, um, I guess, well, the broadcast money, you want cameras and better camera angles means you can have VAR and better technology for that goal line tech, etc. So, yes, Tom is out there crossing his fingers. <laughs> uh, we... Hopefully that's, a, I mean, it's a lot of money to put we in. Need and that's that's what we what's need it. Yeah, need. exactly. Um, one other interesting part of the new deal, uh, which we were also talking about off air, is that players will be given digital rights to show their own highlight clips on social media channels. This arrangement is seen to be seen as being unique to the WSL and will help players enhance their brands. This was like... I still don't know what that means. Yeah, exactly. like I know what it like, means, but cool. I don't because we <laughs> talked about it. Like, how many players do you know post their own highlights like that? You know what I mean? Yes. Like, usually, if they do, it's like they're sharing the team Twitter, like posting something, or team Instagram posting something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, like, very rarely have I seen a player just wake up and be like, Oh, by the way, here's my highlights. Now, maybe part of that is because they never had access to that, so maybe, maybe we are going to start seeing players do that more, but. Uh, it's interesting, interesting, for sure. I would be interested to see how that would affect um, them using those highlights, maybe for um, their endorsement deals. Whoever, like, because you know, are they a Nike athlete? Are they a Puma athlete? Are they an Adidas athlete? Um, if they're able to use those images of those highlights in a way that they have not been able to be to before for marketing campaigns. So I, I do wonder if that might be part of it too. Yeah. I'm interested to see how that plays out. Cause that is like a unique kind of little tidbit to throw into a deal. I mean, it's definitely unique to WSL because I haven't heard of such a thing in the NWSL. Mm -hmm. um, but also I don't, Think that there's anything preventing nwsl players from doing it because here like in our in our sports leagues we have what is known as a player image and likeness uh for every sport and usually uh players under their agents and management tend to keep the ability to use their image and their likeness for whatever they want whether that's uh like tom said marketing campaigns or just you know, some players use it for like different edits to engage with fans and stuff like that. But yeah, it'll be interesting. I'm interested, interested to see what that means because I'm still not totally sure exactly what they mean by that. Yeah. And if it's something that players maybe wanted or if something they asked for, I wonder if with the WSL, especially some of the like lower teams or the players who are not necessarily on their national team or haven't broken on yet, if they can use those to show like, with these clips, you know, like I take control of what I send to my national team kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm not sure. For that level, I understand. Like if you're a championship team, like Mark was saying, that gets yeah. shown on YouTube once every season, maybe, you know, it would be good to yeah. be a player to be like, yo, look, here's my highlights. Sign me. I know you need a right winger. Sign me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's a good um, deal. Money coming in. Always great when money comes in. 
Yep. And more money is going to be coming in, allegedly, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> Europe as a whole. Um, Mark, I know you're researching a bunch about this, so why don't you tell us more? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's kind of uh, two, two separate uh, headlines came out, uh, but it is kind of, uh, you know, the, the main theme being investment. So UEFA has pledged to commit a billion euros uh, as part of a new six-year strategy uh, to basically improve the women's game. Um, I, one thing I, I think is kind of funny, kind of cute almost, is the, the titles for these strategies, right? So uh, UEFA is naming theirs Unstoppable. Um, and <laughs> this is supposed to be for the period of uh, 2024 to 2030. Um, and so it's basically they're trying to achieve long-term sustainability within the women's game, right? Um, and so the main goals in this period are to uh, increasing the number of totally professional leads on the continent from four to six, um, and providing universal access to grassroots football and launching a second club competition with more opportunities for clubs to compete in UEFA competitions. Um, I'm reading that off of the uh, athletic article uh, written by Megan Faringa. If you have a subscription, you should check it out. But uh, yeah, so he, uh, there's some things there to unpack that we thought were interesting. So first of all, what is a professional league or a fully professional league, right? And uh, that would be a league where uh, all of the clubs are fully professional, which means that uh, those players can survive on their football salary and don't have to like take out second jobs to supplement their football career and so forth. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, clubs in the women's game in Europe currently that, and, and the US to be honest, that operate on a semi-professional level, right? And so you have to imagine uh, that has implications in terms of uh, salary, in terms of facilities, right? You know, um, you know, like I wonder for a player who needs some sort of medical attention, for example, if they play the semi-pro club, like how do they go about that, right? Are there club doctors? Do they have to seek that on their own and so forth? So um, now as far as we understand, the four leagues that are fully professional as of now are um, in England, Spain, Germany, and Italy? Or France. was it France? France, That's right. yeah. France, yeah. Um, Italy is the, one of those that is not. Yeah, which is it says it is on the wiki page, but then I guess it's not. I don't. Whatever. We're, we're gonna go with the athletics reported. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, Italy, I would imagine, would be one of those teams that they would be trying to bring up to um, fully professional, along with uh, let's see. So we mean England, Spain, Germany, France. Who who would be the sixth league? Did we ever clarify? Tom. Uh, Air Divi Air well, that I would think, mm. yeah, either the Dutch or even the Swedish league. I think uh, mm. the, I can't. I won't pronounce. Probably it, Dutch, though. I feel like because yeah. I feel like they would want Ajax and them to kind of get. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, Tom. Does the Swe does the Swedish team play the UEFA calendar? No, they don't. They are. I think they're the same time as the NWSL calendar. Just because they're so far north. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's weird because I think they start like Champions League towards the end of their season, whereas obviously, like all, all the other UEFA teams are starting towards the beginning of their season. Um, I don't know if that would impact whether like how much they pledge into this or what this means for them, but. Yeah, that's a good point to make that they're kind of on different calendars as well. Mm -hmm. um, so something that, you know me, I love my fun facts, right? Uh, something that I thought was interesting uh, from this article. Uh, so between 2021 and, well, sorry, between the, the 2020 and 21 season and the 23 24 season, the percentage of women's top division clubs that operated independently of men's clubs decreased from 46% to 34%. Uh, however, the percentage of men's UEFA Champions League group stage clubs to have a women's team also increased up from 66% to 88% uh, in the most recent season. 
so basically what that yeah it suggests that there's uh there's a strong correlation with the women's teams that um uh, are successful and actually have the resources with like the richer clubs in europe right so um you know uefa i guess is trying to be proactive in growing the women's game specifically you know and not just basically leaving it to those clubs to kind of sort it out um which is great i mean you know i don't i don't want to be cynical about that at all obviously we i think all have a healthy skepticism of uefa and these boards in general to actually follow through on their investment in women's football but um you know this is a step in the right direction and i mean that is a sizable investment to make mm -hmm. uh yeah and then the second kind of part of that not uefa related but the the fa here in england um the football association introduced another kind of pledge over the next four years uh more for grassroots football um and yeah, if you want to tell us about that, that one's called Reaching Higher. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to pull from The Guardian from uh, Tom Gary. Uh, the Football Association is aiming to see 90% of schools providing girls with equal access to football at key stages two and three by 2028 as part of a new four year strategy to grow women's and girls' football. Um, a little bit further down in the article, it goes on to say, uh, it also includes plans to enhance education and female health and well-being support, embed national safeguarding policies, and to develop more women referees and women in coaching. Um, now, we talked about, uh, so we talked about the investment that Barclays has pledged. Uh, well, they, so they, they came to an agreement with WSL, right, which was the, I think it was 60 million pound uh deal over, th over the next three years um before that they also announced uh that they were making a pledge or investment specifically into girls football and grassroots football um now i think at that time they didn't necessarily have details i think that was more just uh, a pledge to you know commit a certain amount of money towards that so this seems to be uh a follow-up to that with an actual strategy to put in place um and you know just to kind of understand why this is important um so they're still trying to you know they're still trying to develop grassroots football for uh girls in england right um and so uh, Tom Gary goes on to mention in the article that 85% uh, of primary schools are affording girls equality for the quality of football access and PE lessons. And so uh, that has been, they've seen that number go up since 2020, and especially post uh, the Lionesses winning Euros. Uh, but only about half of secondary schools, schools still do not offer girls uh, the same football opportunities as boys. And so secondary school, for those who don't know, is basically high school in England, right? So you're talking about girls, probably about the age, from the ages of about 12, 13 to 18, not having access to playing football. Um, and, you know, you can kind of see why there might be, why, you know, there might be almost like a drop off in terms of, or why the talent pool might not be um, as big as other countries like Germany, or France, or Spain. Uh, who have, you know, they have those pipelines in place. So, um, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, it's it's interesting, I guess, you know, from an American perspective, seeing how uh, another country is uh, going about, you know, trying to develop the game for girls. You know, of course, in the U.S., uh, we have Title IX that kind of protects the rights mm -hmm. of, uh, of girls to, well, to participate in sports in general. And I think that's been a big part of why the U.S. were so successful in the 90s and so forth. I mean, you know, like colleges have been producing players forever. You know, it's just a matter of having a league for them to play and a national team and so forth. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm excited for, for England about this, you know, and, you know, and as we mentioned with the UEFA pledge, you know, it's just a matter of them following through and seeing the fruits of those efforts. Yeah, and I think that, secondary school time period is really important for the development of players because 
like you said, like it provides an avenue for them to perhaps like get an education abroad and play in the States um, where college football is college soccer is huge for the women. Uh, And we even see a bunch of players being signed now, like around that age. So having maintaining development into that, like the teens, I guess, of their (laughs) um, age, not, I don't necessarily agree with like 14 and 15 year olds being signed to professional teams, but it is what it is. It's going to happen. So having that opportunity just opens another door for players. So it's, I, I don't know if I understand why it happens that like, there's more teams and such in primary school and more avenues for kids to play. And then it kind of drops off. Um, but I do think it's good that they're focusing on the grassroots level. Yep. High school is also like where people like athletes, especially kind of make that decision in terms of, do I want to stick with this sport or do I yes. want to move on to like a regular job, so to speak. And I mean, I think it also speaks to the greater, quote unquote, issue that England feels like they have over there, which is not enough English talent filling up their leagues. Well, it's hard to do that when you cut off the most important formative years of an athlete's life. Uh, If you're not offering high school, essentially what is the equivalent of high school sports, you know, how do you expect the people in your country to then continue that sport? Like like Deep D said, it's hard to play that sport at, at competitive levels until you're 13 and then take a five year break and then hope that you can play at the university level. Like it's just not conducive to national success. And I think, uh, I think that's definitely the difference when you look at other countries and, you know, I know a lot of people are going to get mad, but like, especially in America where we have that high school to college pipeline, like that is huge in terms of not just play time, but like, like DB mentioned, just teams identifying that talent. Now, I mean, you have half of the NWSL looking at high school kids, uh, as part of their future and as part of their scouting. So definitely think that investing more in that level is going to help England, not just uh, in in growing the game, but in in probably helping them keep a lot of their talent in country. Yeah. Um, Tom, do you have any more thoughts on that? Um, I mean, high schoolers are not just high school age players are not just some NWSL clubs future. It's some NWSL clubs now. Um, (laughs) so you would think that, um, cutting off those app, like, just like, like Trev said, cutting off those avenues for those players to develop, um, when the structure is so not like you're looking for exceptions and not like building a system for rules. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of madness. So, like, it, you got to start at the bottom. Exactly. Um, all right. Moving on. Uh, this headline uh, made me mad. And I saw actually the video that I'm going to reference right now first and then read the article about it. But um, basically, there's a, a female footballer, Ikra Ismail, who is Muslim who plays for um, one of the semi-professional teams in Greater London, in the Greater London Women's Football League. And last weekend, uh, she was prevented from entering the field of play by the referee for wearing track suit bottoms rather than shorts. Uh, And the referee claimed that uh, the league had told him strictly not to allow women to wear tracksuit bottoms regardless of the color or whether it was matching the kit or not. Uh, so Ismail posted this video on social media saying, the Greater London Women's Football League have stopped me from playing because of my religious beliefs, because I refuse to wear shorts with my playing kit. I have been playing in this league for almost five years now wearing tracksuit bottoms and every year they have made it more and more difficult for women like me to play. This year they, drew the li- they have drawn the line and banned me from playing until I compromise my beliefs. Um, and then actually the, a spokesperson for the FA, um, wrote to Sky Sports News and said, 
We're aware of this matter. We're in contact with the Middlesex FA to ensure that is quickly resolved. We proactively wrote to all county FAs and match officials across the women's grassroots game earlier this year to confirm that women and girls should be allowed to wear clothing that ensures their faith or religious beliefs are not compromised. We remain deeply committed to ensuring that English football is an inclusive and welcoming environment for everyone. Uh, so, yeah, it. There's not much more on this. Um, obviously, this we've seen this kind of issue with um, Muslim players, like especially in France. Actually, a lot of that has like not being able to wear hijabs. In this case, it's not being able to wear pants um, instead of shorts. And so, it's it's 2024. This shouldn't still be an issue. It should never have been an issue, but it definitely still shouldn't be an issue. Um, luckily, it seems like the FA said like you know it's we told them that it was okay it may like this ref was just wrong this fa was wrong um so hopefully it's been resolved but yeah it's disappointing to say the least that there are players still being held back and treated like this yeah um agreed like i think that you referenced France. Like, if you told me this headline came out of France, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that checks out. But, yeah. you know, there's just no, I mean, and that, and that ref, you, you know, that ref's full of it. I'm sorry. There's just <laughs> <laughs> like, there's just no way I'm believing you. I'm sorry. Yeah. Saying that he was strictly told not to, it, it's, yeah, Tom. <laughs> Uh, I was just, this will be the one and only time that you will ever hear me say this, but good on the FA for the statement that they made. Like, um, that was a pretty strong and direct statement without calling out the referee necessarily, like calling them out by name and saying that they were wrong. Um, I uh, really hope that uh, the Middlesex FA takes this truly seriously and... Um, has a conversation with that referee if they have not already. Agreed. Um, yeah, and this cut, this goes back to what you know the FA, the football association, was saying about making it more accessible at the grassroots level. Like it's it's not just the investment, it's not just having it available in these schools. It's this is obviously past like the secondary school level. This is still part of the leagues, but it, it keeps going on from there. And it's not just money. It's not just having space for them to play. It's having a welcoming and not, uh, it should be an inclusive space for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way it will grow. Um, okay, so yeah, so uh, we said we weren't going to focus on uh, too many matches, but we had to talk about the lionesses, you know. I mean, like, as a, we're gonna make like, people mad, we're gonna have our audience hate us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, I mean, hate us any more than they apparently dislike Serena Beekman right now, like, <laughs> yeah, but uh. Yeah, so the Lionesses uh, lost to Germany 3-4. They were down 3-0 pretty quickly in that match, kind of gave away um, just, some, just some shocking defense overall. Um, I didn't actually watch this match, but I did see uh, the screenshot of the entire defensive line within 15 yards of each other on one side of the field. I'm not sure how that happened. Um and then they did beat South Africa 2-1, but even that, in that one, not too convincing. Um, you know, there's a lot of worries about the defense. You know, and what I thought was most interesting, uh, even before the first match in the uh, in the press conference, Beekman was asked about uh, Fran Kirby and what she would have to do, I guess, to get back into the, the national team fold. And... Um, I mean, the video, I, it, it pretty clearly to me seemed like she was saying she needs more minutes with the national team, right? Like, I guess it's been a while. I mean, I think she ended up not playing with the national team in this international break because I think she, there's some sort of uh, small injury that she picked up. But, um, but so the 
Sky Sports tweeted that that clip, and they do the thing where you know they take one quote out of context, right? Uh, where they said uh, Frank Kirby, all they all they said in the in the tweet was Frank Kirby needs more minutes, and there's a bunch of people in the replies like, ah, oh, she's playing for Brighton. This is just you picking favorites. Like, what do you, Viva doesn't know what she's doing. Um, so I don't know. The vibes seem a little down right now in the England camp. Yeah, it's I okay. I guess I'll give uh, Lucy Bronze and Georgia Sandway credit a little bit to what they said afterwards. Um, basically, they both were like, "We're in a time of evolving. Like the the English team is evolving right now. We had such a high, um, obviously, with the Euros win and then getting to the final of the World Cup, and now we're kind of plateauing." Um, and that makes sense. Like you can't always expect to keep winning and keep winning. And they're like, yeah, we're, we're bound to hit a plateau. The other teams are bound to like figure out how to beat us. And that's the point that we're at right now. And what we need to do is just evolve and get better and figure out how to beat them again. So they were, they were just asking for patience, which yes, I get, but also I think, yeah, it's up to Serena to decide like right now, does she want to bring in players and try to decide are they still fit enough for the national team or should she start branching out um, and trying to not rebuild? I don't think rebuild's the right word, but bring in some new talent to the squad. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be wise. You know, the Euros are next summer they only have a handful of international uh, breaks before then you know england's one of the teams that are through to the euros now so they're only playing friendlies or i don't know if they do any more nations league from here on out but yeah i mean like it's it i, I think she's actually in kind of a tough spot right because it's like you don't you really don't have that much time with the team and then so like if uh let's just i'm just throwing something out there let's say you replace Leah Williamson for a match. Do you then, are you going to make a decision based on that, right? Like, in a friendly, you know, like, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I I can understand why she would give certain players a longer look than other players, but yeah, it's, it's I, I, like I said, I, I sympathize with her. I know that Alex Greenwood has to be just seething watching that performance um, in the first match at Wembley. And like, how can I not get on? Like, y'all had 15 defenders within, like four defenders within 15 yards and I can't get on the pitch. Like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, I, I know that I say that like from a city perspective, um, obviously. Um, but yeah, their defending is atrocious. And like, if they're going to play like that again, they're friendly against the US. Boy, <laughs> how. <laughs> yeah. I think speaking of the US, like they could take lessons from the US because that was the biggest reason why uh, the US women's national team went through that lull and went through that rough patch was because they themselves were hanging on to a lot of players past where they should have. And they themselves should have taken the chances on a lot of the youth coming up in their talent pool. Uh, I mean, right now you have, like we talked about earlier with the international players, you have Lexi Potter coming to the uh, to the ranks. You have Michelle Agamemnon coming to the ranks. Like you have talented youngsters, you know, ready for chances. And I think if not now, then when? Because yeah, the Euros are coming up quick, but also as it looks, you're not going to win the Euros with this team. Like, if that's if that's the best you have, if that's your defense, you're not – I'm telling you right now, you're not winning that tournament. Um, so, in my opinion, the best you can do is get a look at some of, uh, of the young players. Get a look at what some of the defensive kind of partnerships look like, different ones, try out different players. Look at the talent you have coming up because, you know, Euros is around the corner, World Cup right after. It, it's – it's going to come thick and fast. And the last thing you want to do is, and speaking from experience, like the last thing you want to do is hang on to these players 
past where you should have let them go because it's just going to cause uh, deeper problems for you as a federation in the long run. Yeah, and it's interesting for them and all UEFA teams that pretty almost every international break has games of consequence. So it's like, what, like, which breaks do you take to bring yeah. in those new players? Like, when do you take that chance of bringing a new squad? Because if it's not an actual tournament, then it's qualifiers for the tournament. Um, so I, I understand that it might be difficult to figure out what the best time is to kind of inject new talent, but it has to be done at some point. Um, you know, most the other teams have like the non UEFA teams had three years between Olympics and World Cup, but because UEFA teams have the Euros, they have one less year. Um, so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, but I think it will be really fun to see like a young English squad with like the up and coming U twenty threes, U twenty players who are currently there with the like the latest roster that we've seen for the U S with all the new and young people as well. I think that would be a showdown. Yeah. I, um, you mentioned you had that quote earlier from, uh, I think it was Stanley about plateauing. Mm -hmm. um, Vigman's kind of on a plateau, right? Like she won <laughs> the euros in 2017, went to the 2019 world cup final won the Euros in 22, went to the 23 World Cup final. So it's like, it, it, it's it's interesting uh, just seeing this criticism level, right? Because I even saw someone say, uh, you know, this, what's happening in England is mirroring what happened with the Netherlands where, you know, kind of it grows a little stale at the end and um, and then she's out, you know? So I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how just the take your chance with the kids. Months. You got to take yeah, a chance yeah. with the kids. Because if you're going to get out anyway, like if people are already calling for your job, you have nothing to lose. And with yeah. a stretch of friendlies, like no, no turn, like uh, Deep D said, no games of consequence coming up until the Euro tournament. If not now, then, then, when? then when? And if you have players talking about you're stagnant and you're plateauing and give us time, like even they can see, you probably need to refresh things. Yeah. That's true. Have people been calling for Serena's job, or are they just like she needs to change things? Yeah, Has it become that dire yet. Well, I don't, I don't know, know if it's dire, but there's whispers. Yeah, it's one of you the, know how sports like, are. Yeah, yeah, right. Like her leaving now would be crazy, right? Like I don't think anybody really wants that, but I think it's kind of a uh, oh, if we don't, or if this Euro is this going like we think it's going to go, then you know we got to move in a new direction. Which honestly, like, I kind of wonder. I mean, she's been an international manager for so long, but she considered the club game. <laughs> Tom, did you just call Serena Vigman um, Southgate? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now wait a minute. Those were not my words. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you put that evil on me, Tom. I mean, that's what it sounded like to me. <laughs> well, no, because she's actually won. So, you know. True. At two places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. But club's a good shot. That's interesting. Fair. Fair. Uh, I could see it. The last headline that we're going to touch on today is that the uh, Jamaica Football Federation reinstated Hubert Busby Jr., um, who had been suspended by the Federation for the last two and a half years, um, as he had been alleged to have made sexual advances towards a player when he was coach of the Vancouver Whitecaps women's team in 2010 and 2011. Um, this I am pulling from The Guardian by Matthew Hall. Um, JFF said, quote, after careful consideration and due process, our technical committee has recommended the immediate reappointment of Hubert Busby as women's head coach of the senior women's national team. He was removed from the position when the JFF requested FIFA to investigate unsavory media reports originating in Europe. FIFA subsequently cleared Mr. Busby. Um, 
The article one paragraph later says, FIFA, however, has confirmed to The Guardian its ethics committee closed a preliminary investigation into allegations against Busby without reaching any judgment and that it may reopen an investigation if it receives more information about the original claims. FIFA has not interviewed uh, Mallory Enoch about this at all. That is the player that alleged uh, the sexual misconduct um, from Hubert Busby. Um, listen, I'm going to be very direct when I say this. Um, JFF is a trash fire when it comes to um, sexual misconduct, sex unwanted sexual advances, unwanted um, sexual abuse. Um, with th this, along with um, naming Mason Greenwood as part of their mm -hmm. uh, men's senior national team is gross. It is disgusting. Um, it does not belong in football at all. And um, JFF, you need to come to Jesus because this is not good enough. You are not doing well enough by um, your players, by your coaches, by your fans. Um, this is not, this cannot be the standard that you hold yourself to. Um, and it just really saddens me that this is um, something that they would allow to go on um, in the name of what they might say to be chasing victories. Um, but it, it's, it's very gross and I hate it. And um, especially, you know, seeing a player like Taylor Hines getting called up uh, to the senior women's national team for Jamaica, um, the countless other Jamaican players um, that are in the w in the WSL or even across the globe, they do not deserve to be subjected to someone who has not, who A, would do that and B, hasn't taken steps to atone for their actions in any in any manner um i really wish that jff would reconsider this con decision um until then i will never have a problem with um bunny declining a national team call up um as a city fan um because it's just gross uh, so i hope that jff can do better Yeah, it's same story, different federation, right? Like we've seen this across the women's game in so many places. Uh, some have been resolved to an extent, but clearly it's not rippling across the world and where it needs to. Um, and federations are still showing why they are trash and why they have not changed one bit, honestly. Uh, so yeah, they are very unserious, very disappointing and infuriating, honestly. Yeah. Anything else to add on that? No, Tom said it. I mean, it's just gross. It's yeah. You can't yeah. claim to protect players and shame on FIFA for that too. Like you can't claim to protect yeah. players and want the best for your players when that's the sham bullshit that you're running. I don't know how yeah. you have any investigation on anyone without even talking to the victim. Like right? that in and of itself lets me know you didn't do anything. So any, yeah. anything else you say after that just lets me further know you you have no idea what you're what you're doing. Well, maybe you have an idea of what you're doing and it's it's definitely uh protecting the wrong people in this sport. So yeah. You know, I'm with Tom, it's I have like no problem with players like saying no i i'm surprised anyone would agree to be part of that federation i'll be honest with you like i i feel bad for players like if that's their only avenue for international football but if you're like a dual national or if you have options i there's no way you could pay me enough to play in that federation right now yeah it's like we've learned nothing from the last several years of stories about sexual harassment, abuse, and all this stuff coming out about different federations and treating players properly. Um, so obviously it's still a long, long way to go in the women's game. and Including yeah. compensating them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, but I think you you guys said it well. Tommy said it well. Um, well, that wraps up the headlines for this last week. That actually was a lot. <laughs> I didn't think we'd be talking that much. Um, but looking ahead to, well, what will be this weekend, uh, it's going to be match day six in the league. Um, all the matches will be on Sunday, November 3rd, uh, starting with what is probably the marquee matchup of the weekend, Manchester United versus Arsenal, uh, coming off the international break where Arsenal players played super well. Um, Manchester United is still on a hot streak uh, that this will definitely be a test, I think, for both teams. Um, so that'll be exciting. Then we have Brighton versus Leicester City, uh, followed by Tottenham versus West Ham, Crystal Palace versus Manchester City, Aston Villa versus Liverpool, and finally Everton versus Chelsea. Um Start with you, Treb. Which match are you looking forward to besides Arsenal? <laughs> uh, okay, we'll see. You threw that in there, besides <laughs> Arsenal. Um, I mean, if I had to choose, probably Villa-Liverpool. That's the most intriguing to me. It's it's kind of a bit of a, you know, a train wreck. You can't really look away type of situation. I, I just really want to see what direction these two teams are headed in. Uh, Liverpool kind of stagnating and and kind of not playing the way we thought that they would and then of course villa is continuing to fight for relegation uh which to me is a surprise i did not have villa as a team sitting as low as they are for as long as they have been so it's definitely a match where they need the win more so but also it feels like a match liverpool can't afford to lose so it's very much like a we'll see who comes to play if Either team, because I mean, it could end in a scoreless draw, but that's the match mm -hmm. I'm looking at the most. If it's not Arsenal, Man United, obviously. Yes. Uh, Tom, how about you? I'm looking at the match on the South Coast with Brighton versus Leicester City. Um, I am wondering, is this a, like a separation match or is this a, a coming together match? Is this a match where Brighton says like, nope, we're in the upper echelon of this league and we're going to stay there? Um, or is this a a match where Lester says like, hey, like we're going to be a pesky team and we're going to stick around <laughs> um, in this league and we have separated ourselves from the glut at the bottom um, and can we you know, be solidly mid table, like, and not have to worry about being in the relegation zone. Um, and I, I do want to see what um, specifically uh, Yanina Leipzig versus this attack. I think that she has been one of the more informed goalkeepers in the league that we're probably not talking about. Um, and she might, she might win the golden gloves because she's going to face a lot of shots. Um, mm -hmm. She might still let, let a lot of shots in, but like she's going to stop a fair few. Um, so I, I just really like Leicester's defense um, against Brighton's offense in this match. Um, not like I like them over it, but I like the matchup of it. Um, it'll be, definitely be strength on strength. Hmm. Yep. Nice. Okay. And Mark, how about you? Um, I am looking at uh, the London Derby, Tottenham versus West Ham. Uh, two teams that I think will be exciting, two teams that have allowed a lot of goals this season. Um, <laughs> for Tottenham, um, I think this is kind of a must win. One, just to get their season on track. You know, they uh, their only win in their last five matches is against Charlton. Um and then after this week, they have City and Arsenal in back-to-back -back weeks. So um kind of feels like if they don't get all three points uh, in this match, it could be kind of a, you know, really rough stretch. And, um, you know, for West Ham, you know, there's they, they're, in, they're in the throes of the relegation race. So uh, any point they can get, this feels like an opportunity there where they could maybe steal a point, if not all three. Um they play oh Leicester God, so and funny. right. Oh man! Oh, and if they I'm beat sorry, Tottenham, yeah. actually, they would uh, be on top of Tottenham, which would be hilarious. Yeah, so, yeah. it would just be hilarious. <laughs> it would be so funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I think that'll end up being exciting. Yeah, I think this 
week. We I, I feel like we've been saying this every week where every week is better than the previous one, but um, this one definitely seems like it could shake up the table, like whichever way each of the matches go. Uh, so that'll be interesting. Like just to, to recap, um, currently we have Manchester City sitting at top of the table uh, with 13 points off of five games. Um, Chelsea has uh, is in second with 12 points, but they have a game in hand. They've only played four. Manchester United also has a game in hand. Um, they're at 10 points. Brighton is also at 10 points. And then uh, just to go down the list of the rest, it's Arsenal, then Liverpool, Leicester, Tottenham, Crystal Palace, Aston Villa, Everton, and West Ham is in the relegation spot. Um, but yeah, any any win over another team can shake up the table a lot. So uh, this week, as we say every week, will be exciting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Any last thoughts, guys? Um, I'm just happy that WSL is back. Although this was a fun international break. I'm kind of looking forward to the next one. Yeah. It was definitely fun from an Arsenal perspective. I mean, it feels like everyone in our starting 11 scored. It feels like. <laughs> feels Cause like, like Williamson, Williamson got her goal. Uh, I mean, Cooney Cross, Stinius. I mean, just the yeah. list goes on. Pretty much everyone. Katie, uh, Rita, McCabe. Katie McCabe. I mean, like, yeah, I think everyone did. Em- I feel like Emily Fox also scored, or maybe she set up a goal. I feel like she did no, something. Yeah. In one of the I think games. most most of them either scored or assisted. So She got rest. That one game, there was that one game <laughs> where she got rest. That was great. That was Emily the Fox. win. That was the win for her. Uh, yes. But, yeah, I'm just, like Mark said, I'm happy to be back. This is, we talked about it a little bit last week, and I'll probably mention it a whole bunch in the coming weeks, but this is going to be a crucial month for several teams because they will be playing teams around them. So it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. Yes. I am interested to see how the um, three uh, WSL teams in Champions League handle the month um this will be a big month for all three of those squads just as as the amount of matches that they have to play and the amount of travel that they will have to do to play those matches uh i am really interested to see how they will handle that moving forward um because i because arsenal plays juve back to back correct in well, like juve maybe, tottenham juve and then has the a very yeah. tough match yeah correct yeah. Yeah. So I think that that will be um, super key um, mm-hmm. in this league, just seeing how all three of those teams are able to manage uh, playing in Europe and playing in the league um, and, you know, fighting for league supremacy essentially at this point. Because um, I don't think that you can really overstate that that those are the most, the three most talented teams in this league. Mm-hmm. yeah agreed all right well thank you guys for listening to our first international break episode uh kind of a different format um but it was nice to go through yeah you know, highlight different players go through different storylines from the last week and a half or so uh you can find us on apple spotify youtube wherever you listen to your podcast hit that follow button to stay up to date when new episodes drop Leave a rating and a review if you can. We would love to hear your feedback. There are 12 teams, six matches, four hosts. You're listening to the 12. The WSL is back this weekend, so enjoy it, and we will see you next week.